Hey, good morning, folks, and welcome to Prophetic Edge. As promised, um, a little bit late than usual, um, but uh, here we are um, with this study about Jesus being God. So we're going to look into a couple of things today, and hopefully I'll be able to um, explain um, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 20. And um, now we need to understand, of course, why Paul actually wrote this letter. This letter is written to the church in Colossae. And um, this church wasn't founded by Paul. It was Epaphras who actually went to Colossae and preached the gospel. Later on, um, you know, Paul actually writes to the Colossians. Now he's writing to the Colossians because there has been severe threats against the deity of Christ. You know, many have questioned, um, you know, the deity of Christ, the, the, the preeminence of Christ, the supremacy of Christ. And Paul writes this letter and warns the church in Colossae. And uh, he basically said to them just to watch out, just to be careful in regards to uh, wrong doctrines that has been creeping uh, very slowly in the church. And we see John addresses the same thing in his letter, that there was a heresy that was pervading the church in, um, in those regions. And um, Paul says to the Colossians, that this letter needs to be um, read at Laodicea as well. And so there's this, um, this threat that was causing havoc in the midst of the church. There were, um, you know, there was someone by the name of Arius, and this is where you get the Arianism um, doctrine, and the Arianism doctrine basically, um, you know, uh, teaches that Jesus is not co-eternal with God, that Jesus is not God, and that Jesus is simply a divine being. And uh, I'd love to, to get into this right now. And um, let's have a look. I've, I've jotted a couple of things here. Um you know, primarily this letter has been written by Paul himself uh, while he was in chains. In Colossians chapter 4, 18, uh, Paul says, in closing, he said, this salutation is by my own hand. Paul, remember my chains, grace be with you. Amen. Now, in this letter, now, we need to remember that this is a letter that Paul sent to the um, Colossians. And this letter, the purpose of this letter is to establish and reinforce the supremacy and sufficiency of Jesus Christ. The church in Colossae, like I've said before, the church in Colossae was facing severe contests with various aspects of paganism. I'm going to show you in a minute, and, and I'm just going to tell you very briefly what the church was facing with. The church was facing with paganism, heresies, asceticism, uh, asceticism uh, which means that self-denial, obstinance, practices um, of um, holy days, um, you know, practices such as body mortification and intentionally inflicting pain on oneself. And often that would happen through you know, fasting. Many people will fast and they think in their fasting that they're going to get closer to God. People think that, you know, that they should worship on a special day, on the Sabbath day. If, if you don't worship God on the Sabbath day, then you are not the remnant. If you worship God on a Sunday, the first day of the week, that you will have the mark of the beast or you will you are worshiping the sun god and these teachings are actually very alive today in uh, in the church and there are many people who believe that um, god has appointed a certain day for them to um to worship 
And if you don't worship on those days, they become very judgmental and very critical and very legalistic about it and say that you are not worshiping God as God has instituted. And now remember that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, right? And, and, and remember, it doesn't, for me, it doesn't really matter what day you actually worship. I mean, uh, for me, I believe that, uh, you know, we worship God every day. Our life is a life of worship. Our life is a life of dedication to God. And we worship God in spirit and in truth. Jesus says, you know, there's coming a day that you're not going to worship in Jerusalem or on this mountain when he was talking to the Samaritan woman. He said to the Samaritan woman, there's a day coming that God the Father is actually seeking for worshippers who worships him in spirit and in truth. So, um, and also in those, in um, in those times, they were uh, telling people to abstain from certain food and to, um, you know, practice the holy days and, and, and the Sabbath and the new moon, etc., etc. So that was creeping into the church. What was creeping into the church also was Greek philosophies. Worship of angels. Greek philosophies was very prominent. Uh, back back then and still prominent today in our in our in our day and that's creeping into the life of the church as well and worship of angels and uh, reliance on human wisdom secret mysteries that only the elite had access to secret knowledge the observance of holy days and circumcision so Paul, when he writes this letter, he actually cements his position and his Christology in this letter, and he redirects his um, at the saints at Colossae. He redirects their attention uh, to keep the main thing, the main thing that is of utmost importance, that everything that they are seeking for is found in Christ. We need to understand this, friends. If, if, uh, if there are things that we are coming to, if there are um, revelations that we are coming to, now, I don't believe there are new revelations. I believe that those revelations are revealed when our eyes are open. Those revelations are, are actually in the Word. And when our eyes are open, we actually understand what Jesus says and what Jesus teaches and what the apostle teaches. And so they are not new as such, but there are at the moment new revelations um, coming forth. And the Greek uh, philosophies are actually, you know, creeping very slowly and, and rapidly, I would say, in the church. Uh, where human wisdom, people are building the church on human wisdom. I mean, you know, and, and, and they're not relying totally on the Holy Spirit to do His work. And so there are a lot of, uh, you know, Jesus plus something, Jesus plus the Lord, Jesus plus the Sabbath, Jesus plus um, certain rules and regulations, Jesus plus something. And so we need to understand that, you know, um, you know, the law and, 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 and Jesus, the covenant that we have is the new covenant, right? We cannot mix both. We cannot mix grace and law. And so all these things are happening in Colossae. So Paul here reinforces and cement this truth of the supremacy of Christ. Like in Colossians chapter 1 verse 13, for example, he says, In Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. It is in Christ, in no one else. No one can forgive your sin. No one can redeem you. It's the blood of Jesus that redeems us. It's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We receive forgiveness of sins through Christ. Amen. For Colossians chapter 1 verse 16. For by him all things were created and all things were created through him 
and for him. So we see there that by Christ, all things were created, you know, visible and invisible, like Colossians 1.15 actually tells us, whether thrones or powers, all things, everything that we see has been created by Christ, through Christ and for Christ. Colossians chapter 1 verse 6, 17, Christ is before all things and in him all things consist. In Christ all things consist. Everything is held by Jesus. Colossians chapter 1 verse 18, Christ is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead and in all things he, have, he has what? Preeminence over all. He has a supreme authority and dominion over all. Colossians chapter 1 verse 19. In Christ dwells all the fullness of deity. The word deity um, is actually in the Bible. When, 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 when you read Colossians, uh, you'll see there. Uh, Colossians chapter um Chapter 1, uh, you'll see it there very clearly. Clearly, you'll see it in chapter 2 as well. Amen. And so, uh, deity uh, comes from the Latin word for God, deus. When a person believes in the deity of Christ, he is saying, I believe that Jesus is God. Jesus Christ is the supreme being. That's what we say when we say that, when we believe in the deity of Christ, that's what we're saying. He is more than just mere men. He is more than a prophet. He is more than a teacher. He is more than a healer. He is more than a provider. He is more than a savior. He is actually God. The divine nature of the deities is believed to be immortal, goodness, powerfulness. It means that Christ is described as eternal. You see, Arius, Arius or Arius didn't believe that Christ was co-eternal with God. He didn't believe that Christ was God, right? And so um, it means that is. Christ is described as eternal, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, and immutable. Colossians chapter 1 verse 20. All things has been reconciled back to the Father, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Through his blood, um, peace was established for, um, for us all. Peace was established through the death and the resurrection of Christ. It's through who? Through Christ that the world has been reconciled back to the Father. And just some of us are aware of it and others aren't aware of it as yet. And that's why Paul says that we are ministers of reconciliation. Amen. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 verse 27. You can see what Paul is trying to do here. The, my the mystery explained. To them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul is saying, hey, this mystery that, that um, Arius is actually preaching, this doctrine that they are preaching, you know, the mystery is that Christ is in you, the hope of glory. The hope of glory, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Colossians chapter 2 verse 3. All the hidden mysteries and treasures of wisdom, because uh, the Greek philosophers uh, are very good with their human wisdom. And Paul is saying, hey, all the hidden mysteries and treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Christ Jesus. Everything is found in Christ Jesus. If someone is pointing you away from Christ and telling you that Jesus Christ is not God, he is, um, he is trying to drift you away. He is trying to lead you away from the supremacy of Christ. And I've heard people talking about this and and friends i've heard people on youtube i've heard people that i know that are talking about this very thing right now that jesus is not god 
And so we need to understand that this letter was actually aimed to dismantle this wrong teaching, this error that has been creeping in the life of the church. And Paul establishes the the supremacy of Christ. You see, Paul always points us to Jesus. John always points us to Christ. Uh, Peter points us to Christ. James points us to Christ. All the apostles and prophets need to point you back to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, amen, who is... Um, who, 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 who is the creator of all things. Amen? And so we need to, be, um, to understand this. So, in Christ, Colossians 2, 9, in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, which means the deity of Christ and the deity of God, and they are complete in Him, who is the head, supremacy, supreme chief, and prominence of all principality and power. Christ has supreme dominion over principalities and powers. And, and, and this, this is really important for us to, to, to do this. It, we have to cement our... our our doctrine, our, our Christology, if you want, in the fact that Jesus Christ is supreme. Jesus Christ is King of kings, Lord of lords, and that he is almighty God. Amen. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11, verse, from verse 11 to 13. In Christ, their heart were circumcised by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, Buried in Christ in baptism, raised with Christ from the dead through faith, and was made alive together with him, having all uh, transgressors, transgression forgiven. In Christ, we have everything we need. And I've said this to so many people, that we can find everything that we need in Christ. And so much so that Peter the Apostle says that, uh, you know, that we are partakers of the divine nature of God, that we have the characteristics of Christ. We are partakers of his divine nature, that Christ has given us everything we need for life and for godliness. Everything has been given to us by Christ to live this life um, in victory to live this life above the circumstances that we are facing right now. So, in, in the second century Christian church, you have this heretical um, uh, group that was rising up, and you may have heard Gnosticism, right? Gnosticism, the, the, the doctrine of the Gnostic. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this to you. Gnostic doctrine taught that the world was created and ruled by a lesser divinity, right? And that Christ was an emissary of the remote supreme divine being. That's what they call the esoteric knowledge of whom enabled the redemption of the human spirit. Now, there's nothing wrong in the the redemption or the reg regeneration of your spirit, right? But when you say that Jesus is a lesser divinity and that he was emissary of the remote supreme divine being, you are saying that Jesus is not God. In the Gnostic Christian tradition, Christ is seen as a divine being which has taken human form in order to lead humanity back to recognition of its own divine nature. And there are many people. Now, I do believe that we have the divine nature, and the divine nature is given to us through what Jesus did. But many people right now are talking about them being divine. Now, I can understand 
what they're trying to say, what they are trying to imply. But if they try to imply this outside of Christ, if they're trying to imply this by saying that Christ is not God, they are denying Christ as God. And we've, we've seen throughout this, these teachings that I've gone through, the irrefutable uh, evidence through the word as we, as, as we actually teach from the Old Testament and the New Testament that Jesus is actually God. I want to read something that I was reminded today by, by John the Apostle. John the Apostle in chapter 4 of his first letter says this, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world, right? And some of those false prophets went out from the church, right? And they were teaching and uh, false doctrine. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. The Logos, the Word the eternal word, the Logos, Jesus, has come into the world, right, is from God. Every spirit that acknowledges Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. That's the incarnation. God becomes man. He uh, he humbles himself and becomes in the likeness of man. He, he took the form of a servant and came to serve humanity and to lay down his life for humanity. Amen. He says that, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. Now, folks, I don't want you... the. The things that I don't want you to do is this. Do not attack the person. There is a spirit of Antichrist that is operating, that is leading them, that is drifting them away from Christ, away from the supremacy of Christ, away from believing that Jesus Christ is God. So the person is gone into error. Believing that Christ is not God. I don't want you to attack the person. I don't want you to be zealots. What I want you to do is to learn from scriptures that every spirit, you need to test them. You need to test the spirit to know whether it is from God or from another source. And so it's important for us to understand this very principle. And... Um, and uh, John says here that this is the spirit of the Antichrist which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. That was when John was in the world. The spirit of Antichrist was flooding the church, right? Trying to lead people away. And, and even Paul says in Hebrews, you know, make sure that you don't drift away. Many people are drifting away slowly from believing that Jesus Christ is actually God. Amen? So I hope this is clear, friends. Um, so here we are. Um, so let's have a look here. Yeah. So in the Gnostic Christian tradition, Christ is seen as a divine being which has taken human form in order to lead humanity back to the recognition of its own divine nature. As we are talking about the supremacy of Christ, we must understand the context of Paul's letter here. This is, the ve this is a very important teaching um, that is creeping in the church. I know I'm repeating myself here. I'm so sorry. But I want you to get this. The doctrine of Arianism is a doctrine that denied the eternality of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as the Logos. Now, the, uh, the Greeks have another philosophy about the Logos. I'm not going to get into this. 
But I want you to understand that the Logos, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. The Logos, very simple, is Jesus. He is the Word. He is the eternal life. He is the Logos. Okay? So, Arius... Uh, or Arius was to push the Christological question back to the origin of the pre-incarnate Logos, the living eternal Word of God, which is Christ. Not the Bible, Christ, okay? Christ is the living Word of God. The Bible um, is the written words of Jesus, okay? So, um, so here we are, Arius said, to quote Socrates Scholasticus, a church historian and a church priest. So Arius quotes Socrates. He says, if the father begot the son, he that was begotten had a beginning of existence. And from this, it is evident that there was a time, a time when the Son was not. Can you see the error? Can you see what Arius is trying to do and what the, uh, the Greek historian is trying to do, this, this priest called Arius, right? Now, Arius was actually refuted by a young man called um, Athanasius, he was a deacon to Alexander. He refuted this heresy. I'm going to read this in a minute in the Nicene Creed. Uh, for a time when the Son was not, if therefore necessary, it's, it's therefore necessarily follows that he had his substance from nothing. If Jesus then is a creative act of the Father, and whatever is begotten of God, then the Son is not co-eternal with the Father. Now, friends, I want you to understand this. Satan, the devil, whoever you want to call him, the accuser of the brethren, questioned the divinity of Christ. He questioned if Christ was the Son of God, the unique Son of God. He questioned him in the wilderness. Remember that. If you are the Son of God. And the same thing is happening in our world today. The same thing that happened in John's era and Paul's era. They were questioning Jesus being God. Now, this young man by the name of Athanasius, deacon to Alexander, refuted this heresy. The Nicene Creed insisted that Christ is of the substance of the Father, thereof sacrificing the impassibility of God, nor the deity of the Son. And so the Nicene Creed refuted that and counted that as error. So, the letter written by Paul to the saints in Colossae again is to reinforce the supremacy of Christ. Jesus is our ultimate reality. Jesus is our ultimate reality. Jesus is the full expression of the Father. Amen? The exact expression of the Father. So, here we are, Jesus is our ultimate reality, which means that Jesus is the absolute foundation of everything that is and the end towards which all points. We do need to make sure that we understand the reality of this powerful truth. Amen? Now, I'm going to touch a little bit on the icon. Right, a little bit on the icon here. What do I mean by that? 
Uh, I mean by what Paul talks about, when Paul talks about the image of God, right? So remember, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, that Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Paul tells us, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. So the icon, the icon, the icon points to Christ. Now you'd, you'd, you'd see in the Orthodox Church that they have the icon of Christ, right? So that icon actually points to Christ. I, I went, I did a job last week uh, in a Greek Orthodox uh, home. Um, I came in, I saw the icon of Christ and the icon of Mary, the icon of the apostle. So the icon is actually an image, right? Now, we don't worship the icon, the image of God. We don't worship the images that is made. But the icon is actually trying to help the people to identify with this picture. Now, although this picture is not Christ's picture or the apostle's picture or Mary's picture, but it points to something, amen? So, um, so Jesus is the physical manifestation of the incarnation. Jesus, who is God the Son, is equal with the Father. John 10.30 says, says this, He who has seen me has seen the Father, so how can you say to us, show us the Father? Ask, how can you say to me, show us the Father? Jesus is God in human Form. He is the invisible image of the invisible God. The God who is seen became seen in the form of Jesus, the man. God in the flesh relating to humanity in their own form was made tangible, capable to be touched, heard, seen, handled, bear witness to. The Logos, the word of life, was manifested in the flesh. Eternal life himself, which was with the Father. Amen. That's the icon. Now, I want to read, right, I want to read a couple of um, scriptures. Hebrew chapter 1, verse 3. I'm going to use several um, translations here. Please bear with me. And this is really important. Paul, uh, uh, not Paul, sorry, the writer of the Hebrew. I love that the writer of the Hebrew didn't actually sign off on his, his letter. He left it open. I believe, this is my own opinion here, that the writer of Hebrews were trying to help people see Christ in every single chapter that was written to the saints. And as you go through the book of Hebrews, you'll see what I mean. If you have a study and you see that in every chapter of the book of Hebrews, you will see Christ exalted and elevated, greater than Moses and superior than the angels. That's what the Hebrew writer brings through. So in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 in the English um, Standard Version, it says this about Jesus. That Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the power of his word. And so we're going to have a look at this image. What does it mean, the image of God? What does it mean that, that Jesus is actually the image of the invisible God? The word now, remember what I said, he is the radiance of the glory of God. Now, the glory is nothing mystical, right? We, we understand, you know, there are several words for glory in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the word glory is the word doxa, meaning opinion. So Jesus is the radiance, exact opinion of God. 
Glory, uh, glory means doxa, meaning a several, several meanings to it. Opinion, dignity, grace, majesty, preeminence. Here we go again. The absolute, perfect, inward, or personal excellency of the Father expressed through Jesus Christ. The most glorious condition and most exalted state. Friends, there is none like Christ. Christ was a perfect example. Christ was sinless. Christ was tempted by the enemy, but he never sinned. He was the perfect Lamb of God. Right? He was the express image of God. Express image of the Father. Amen? Uh, New King James Version says this, Jesus, he, who being the brightness of His glory and express image of His person. Amplified. I love this. Now, the Amplified Bible was actually written by a woman. Thank you, Jesus. Amen? Those who have problems with women, then you're going to have to read your Bible and go through your Bible and and, and see how God actually worked through many women in the Bible. There were women in the Bible that were apostles. Whoa, yes, apostles, women. Okay, I'm not going to get into this teaching right now. But, um, but this was written by a woman. And this is what she says here. He says, she says, Jesus is the sole expression of the glory of God, in bracket, the light being the outraying or radiance of the divine. And it is the perfect imprint and very image of God's nature. When I think about this passage of scripture here, I think about Matthew chapter 17, when Jesus took Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. We see Elijah and Moses appeared, and we see the heaven open. The Father spoke and said to, to Peter, James, and John to listen to, um, to Jesus, right? And in Matthew chapter 17, I want to read this to you because this is a powerful encounter of the transfiguration that happened. Now, Jesus here in the Mount of Transfiguration transfigures. And, 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 and this is what I believe, right? So, the fullness of the glory of God, the fullness of the opinion, the brightness, the majesty, the preeminence, the, the almighty God, the self-existent God, the one who was in the beginning, from the inside, radiated His glory, His majesty, is awesomeness. And in this transfiguration, we see the outward expression of that glory being manifested. This is amazing, friends. I want to read it to you. I wasn't going to read this to you, but I want to read this to you. And this is what it says here. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and his brother, led them on a high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them. Amen. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is so good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard the voice, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. And But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Friends, 
the law and the prophets, the glory of the law, the glory of the prophets just diminishes in the presence of Jesus. Wow. Wow. And the father says, Behold my son, hear him. As I'm doing this, I'm getting like, whoa, goosebumps here. The glory of God. And this is what it's all about. It leads us to Christ. Everything must lead us to Christ. Amen. And uh, in the, um, uh, let's have a look here. Is another translation, the um the Mirror Bible translation says this, that Jesus is the radiant and flawless expression of the person and intent of God. He mirrors God's character, right? When you talk about the expression, that is God's character and exhibits his very attribute in human form. In the Passion Translation Bible, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, the sun is the dazzling radiance of God's splendor, the exact expression of God's true nature is mirror Bible. That is why Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Amen. In John chapter 1 and verse 17, we we read this in John chapter 1, verse 17. We read these words. Um, John says, And of his fullness we have received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him to all of us. The only Son, the begotten Son of God. Jesus is the unique Son of God. This is what it means. You know, you know God has many sons. You know, the angels, the holy ones were called the sons of God. The angels were called the sons of God. You know, many people in the Old Testament were called the sons of God. We are called the sons of God. But there is no one that is as unique as Christ. Why? Because Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus is God. Right? We don't possess all the attributes of God. We don't. We, we have the characteristic, the nature of God living in us, but we are not omnipotent, we are not omnipresent, and we are not omniscient. We are not immutable. We change all the time, but God doesn't change. Jesus doesn't change. God is omnipresence, is everywhere. God is omnipotent. He is almighty. God is omnipresent. Presence. God is omniscience. He knows everything. God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. We are not God. We are sons and daughters of God. But we believe in Jesus being God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This beautiful union. This beautiful trinity. The triune God. Who works together as a community of being beautiful isn't it there is only one god the father the son and the holy spirit are one and no wonder jesus says if you have seen me you have seen the father you have seen the exact representation the character the attributes the love the mercy the grace the um uh, the perfection the transcendency of Christ. You've seen the eternalness of Christ. You've seen the wisdom of God uh, made manifest. You've seen the sovereignty, the faithfulness of God. You've, you've experienced the love of God in Jesus. If you have seen Jesus, you have seen the Father. And that's why it's important for us to point people to Christ. So whoever doesn't point you to Christ, whoever doesn't 
preach the supremacy of Christ is not of Christ. Wow. This is what the scriptures tells us, friends. And so be careful not to be deceived by false doctrine. I'm going to read to you what, uh, what um, Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. I'm going to finish with this. And this is so important, friends. He says this. I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at La Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face that their hearts may be encouraged, being knitted together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance, understanding the knowledge of God's mystery which is in Christ. This is what Paul is trying to allude to. This is what Paul is trying to counter attack because the supremacy of Christ, the mystery of God was becoming something that was so mysterious that only the elite had access to it. Paul is saying, I want you to understand this. I want you, I want you all to reach the riches of the full assurance of understanding of the knowledge of God's mystery, which is in Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one delude you. That, that is a strong word, that no one delude you so that you don't become delusional. That's a term that we use often in, in, my, in my workplace. That, that you don't become delusion. That no one may delude you. We have plausible arguments. My gosh, there are plausible arguments today against the supremacy of Christ, against the deity of Christ. For though I am absent in the body, yet I am with you in the spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Friends, if anything today, I really want you to understand that you need to stand firm in Christ. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of your mind. Stand firm in your belief who Christ is. Christ is God. God bless you.